Ilya, unbelievable. Today is the day after GPT-4. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you here. Um, I'm delighted to have you. I've known you a long time. The journey and just my mental hit, my, my mental memory of, your, of the time that I've known you and the seminal work that you have done, starting in University of Toronto, the co-invention of AlexNet uh, with Alex and Jeff Hinton uh, that led to the big bang of modern artificial intelligence, uh, your career that took you out here to the Bay Area, the founding of OpenAI, GPT-123, and then, of course, ChatGPT, the AI heard around the world. This is, this is the incredible resume of a young computer scientist, um, you know, a, an entire community and industry at all with your achievements. Uh, I guess my, I just want to go back to the beginning and ask you, deep learning, what was your intuition around deep learning? Why did you know that it was going to work? Uh, did you have any intuition that it was going to lead to this kind of success? Okay. Well, first of all, <laughs> thank you so much for the quote, for all the kind words. A lot has changed thanks to the incredible power of deep learning. Like I think this, my personal starting point, I was interested in artificial intelligence for a whole variety of reasons starting from an intuitive understanding of appreciation of its impact. And also I had a lot of curiosity about what is consciousness, what is the human experience. And it felt like progress in artificial intelligence will help with that. The next step was, well, back then I was starting in 2002, 2003, and it seemed like learning is the thing that humans can do, that people can do that computers can't do at all. In 2003, 2002, computers could not learn anything. And it wasn't even clear that it was possible in theory. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that making progress in learning, in artificial learning, in machine learning, that would lead to the greatest progress in AI. And then I started to look around for what was out there and nothing seemed too promising. But to my great luck, Jeff Hinton was a professor at my university. Mm -hmm. And I was able to find him. And he was working in neural networks. And it immediately made sense. Because neural networks had the property that we are learning, we are automatically programming parallel computers. Back then, the parallel computers were small. But the promise was, if you could somehow figure out how learning in neural networks work, then you can program small parallel computers from data. And it was also similar enough to the brain, and the brain works, mm -hmm. so it's like you had these several factors going for it. Now, it wasn't clear how to get it to work, but of all the things that existed, that seemed like it had by far the greatest long-term promise. Even though, now, you know... at the time that you first started, at the time that you first started working with deep learning and, and uh, neural networks, what was, what was the scale of the network? What was the scale of computing at that moment in time? What was it like? An interesting thing to note is that the importance of scale wasn't realized back then. Mm -hmm. So people would just train you know, neural networks with like 50 neurons, 100 neurons. Several hundred neurons, that would be like a big neural network. A million parameters would be considered very large. We, we would run our models on unoptimized CPU code because we were a bunch of researchers we didn't know about BLAS. We used MATLAB. The MATLAB was optimized. <laughs> and we'd just experiment. Like, what is, the, what is even the right question to ask? You know, so you try to, uh, to gather, to just find interesting phenomena, interesting observation. You can do this small thing, and you can do that small thing. You know, Jeff Hinton was really excited about training neural nets on small little digits both for classification and also he was very interested in generating them. So the beginnings of generative models were right there. But the question is like, okay, so you got all this cool stuff floating around. What really gets traction? And so that, it wasn't, so it wasn't obvious that this was the right question back then, mm -hmm. but in hindsight, that turned out to be the right question. Now, now the, the year AlexNet was 2012. Now, 
you and Alex were working on AlexNet for some time before then. And and uh, at, at what point what, at what point was it was it clear to you that you wanted to uh, build a computer vision oriented neural network that ImageNet was the right set of data to go for, and to somehow go for the computer vi- computer vision contest. Yeah. So I can talk about the context there. It I think probably two years before that it became clear to me that supervised learning is what's going to get us the traction. Mm-hmm. And I can explain precisely why. It wasn't just an intuition. It was, I would argue, an irrefutable argument, which went like this. If your neural network is deep and large, then it could be configured to solve a hard task. So that's the key word, deep and large. People weren't looking at large neural networks. People were, you know, maybe studying a little bit of depth in neural networks. But most of the machine learning field wasn't even looking at neural networks at all. Mm -hmm. They were looking at all kinds of Bayesian models and kernel methods, which are theoretically elegant methods, which have the property that they actually can't represent a good solution no matter how you configure them. Whereas the large and deep neural network can represent a good solution to the problem. To find the good solution, you need a big data set which requires it Mm -hmm. and a lot of compute Mm -hmm. to actually do the work. We've also made advanced work. So we've worked on optimization for for a little bit. It was clear that optimization is a bottleneck. And there was a breakthrough by another grad student in Jeff Hinton's lab called James Martins. And he came up with an optimization method which is different from the one we are doing now, using now. Some second order method. But the point about it is that it's proved that we can train those neural networks. Mm-hmm. Because before we didn't even know we could train them. Mm-hmm. So if you can train them, you make it big, you find the data and you will succeed. Mm-hmm. So then the next question is, well, what data? Mm-hmm. And an ImageNet data set. Back mm-hmm. then it seemed like this unbelievably difficult data set. Mm-hmm. But it was clear Mm -hmm. that if you were to train a large convolutional neural network on this data set, it must succeed if you just can have the compute. And right right at that time, GPUs came out. You and I, you and I, uh, our history and our paths intersected. And somehow you had the, 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 the observation that a GPU, and at that time we had, this is our couple of generations into a CUDA GPU, and I think it was GTX 580. Uh, generation, you had the you had the uh, insight that the GPU could actually be useful for training your neural network models. What what was that? How did that day start? Tell me. You know, you and I, you never told me that moment. You know, how did that day start? Yeah. So, you know, the the GP, the GPUs appeared in our in our lab in our Toronto lab, thanks to Jeff, and he said we should, we, got, we should try these GPUs, and mm-hmm. we started trying and experimenting with them, and it was a lot of fun, but, the, but it was unclear what to use them for exactly. Where are you going to get the real traction? But then, with the existence of the ImageNet data set, and then it was also very clear that the convolutional neural network is such a great fit for the GPU. Mm-hmm. So it should be possible to make it go unbelievably fast and therefore train something which would be completely unprecedented in terms of its size. And that's how it happened. And, you know, very fortunately, Alex Krzyzewski, he really loved programming the GPU. And he was able to do it. He was mm-hmm. able to code, to, to program really fast convolutional kernels. Mm-hmm. And, and then and then train the neural net on the image and the data set. And that led to the result. But it was it, like... It shocked the world. It shocked the world. It... it it broke the record of a computer vision by such a wide margin that that it was a clear discontinuity. Yeah. Yeah. And I wouldn't I would say it's not just like there is another bit of context there. It's not so much like when you when we say break the record, there is an important it's like I, w- I think there's a different way to phrase it. Mm-hmm. It's that that data set was so obviously hard mm-hmm. and so obviously outside of reach of anything. People were making progress with some classical techniques and mm-hmm. they were actually doing something. Mm-hmm. 
but this thing was so much better mm. on a data set which was so mm. obviously hard. Mm. It was, it's not just that it's just some competition. Mm. It was a competition which, back in the it day... It wasn't an average benchmark. <laughs> it was so mm -hmm. obviously difficult, yeah. so obviously out of reach, yeah. and so obviously with the property that if you did a good job, that would be amazing. Big bang of AI, fast forward to now. Uh, you came out to the valley. You started OpenAI with some friends. Um, you were the chief scientist. Now, what was the first initial idea about what to work on at OpenAI? Because you guys worked on several things. Some of the trails of, of inventions and, and work uh, you, could, you could see led up to the chat GPT moment. Um, but what were the initial uh, inspiration? What would you, how would you approach intelligence from that moment and led to this? Yeah. So, obviously, when we started, it wasn't 100% clear how to proceed. Mm -hmm. And the field was also very different compared to the way it is right now. So right now, you already used, we already used to, you have these amazing artifacts, these amazing neural nets who are doing incredible things and everyone is so excited. But back in 2015, 2016, early 2016, when we were starting out, the whole thing, thing seemed pretty crazy. There were so many fewer researchers, like hundred, maybe there were between a hundred and a thousand times fewer people in the field compared mm -hmm. to now. Yeah, like true. back then you had like 100 people, most of them were working in Google slash DeepMind and that was that. Mm -hmm. And then there were people picking up the skills, but it was very, very scarce, very rare still. And we had two big initial ideas at the start of OpenAI that, stayed, that had a lot of staying power and they stayed with us to this day. And I'll describe them right now. The first big idea that we had, one which I was especially excited about very early on, is the idea of unsupervised learning through compression some context. Today, we take it for granted that unsupervised learning is this easy thing, you just pre-train on everything and it all does exactly as you'd expect. In 2016, unsupervised learning was an unsolved mm -hmm. problem in machine learning that no one had any insight, exactly. any clue as to what to do. That's right. Jan LeCan would go around and give a talk, give talks saying that you have this grand challenge in supervised learning. And I really believed that really good compression of the data will lead to unsupervised learning. Mm -hmm. Now, co compression is not language that's commonly used to describe what is really being done until recently, when suddenly it became apparent to many people that those GPTs actually compress the training data. Mm -hmm. You may recall the Ted Chiang New York Times article, which also alluded to this. But there is a real mathematical sense in which training these autoregressive generative models compress the data. And intuitively, you can see why that should work. If you compress the data really well, you must extract all the hidden secrets which exist in it. Therefore, that is the key. So that was the first idea that we were really excited about. And that led to quite a few works in OpenAI, to the sentiment neuron, which I'll mention very briefly, it is not, this work might not be well known outside of the machine learning field, but it was very influential, especially in our thinking. This work, like the, the result there was that when you train a neural network, back then it was not a transformer, it was before the transformer. Right. Small recurrent neural network, LST, right. yeah, LSTM, yeah, yeah. to those sequence who remember. Sequence sequence work you've done. I mean, this is some of, your, some of the work that you've done yeah. yourself, yeah. So the same LSTM with a few twists, mm -hmm. trained to predict the next token in Amazon reviews, mm -hmm. next mm -hmm. character. Mm -hmm. And we discovered that if you predict the next character well enough, there will be a neuron inside that LSTM that corresponds to its sentiment. So that was really cool mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it 
showed some traction for unsupervised learning. And it validated the idea that really good next character prediction, next something prediction, compression, yeah. Yeah. has the property that it discovers the secrets in the data. Yeah. That's what we see with these GPT yeah. models, right? Yeah. You train and people say just statistical correlation. I mean, at this point, it should be but so that, clear that to anyone. That observation also, you know, for me, intuitively, open up the whole world of where do I get the data for unsupervised learning? Because I do have a whole lot of data. If I could just make you predict the next character and I know what the ground truth is, I know what the answer is, I could, be, I could train a neural network model with that. So that, that observation and masking and other, other technology, other approaches, you know, open, open my mind about where would the world get all the data that's unsupervised for unsupervised learning. Well, I think, I think, so I would, I would phrase it a little differently. I would say that with unsupervised learning, the hard part has been less around where you get the data from, though that part is there as well, mm -hmm. especially now. Mm -hmm. But it was more about why should you do it in the first yeah, place? Right. Mm -hmm. Why should you bother? Mm -hmm. The hard part was to realize that training these neural nets to predict the next token is a worthwhile goal at all. Mm -hmm. That, was that the it goal. would learn a representation. That it would it would be able to understand. That's right. That it will be yeah, useful. Grammar and yeah. But to actually to act, but it just wasn't obvious. Mm -hmm. Right. So people weren't doing it. But the sentiment neuron mm -hmm. work, and you know I want to call out Alec Radford as a person who really was responsible for many of the advances there. The sentiment this this was this was before GPT one. It was the precursor to GPT one, mm -hmm. and it influenced our thinking a lot. Then the transformer came out, and we immediately went, "Oh my God, this is the thing!" Mm -hmm. And we trained, we trained GPT one. Now along the way, you've always believed that scaling um, will improve the performance of these models. Yes, larger, larger networks, uh, deeper networks, uh, more training data would scale that. Um, there was a very important uh, paper that OpenAI wrote about the scaling laws. And the relationship between um, loss and uh, the size of the model and the, the amount of data set, the size of the data set. Uh, when transformers came out, it gave us the opportunity to train very, very large models uh, in very reasonable amount of time. Um, but with the in, with the, did the intuition about about the scaling laws of the size of of, of models and data, um, and your journey of GPT one, two, three. Um, which came first? Did you see the evidence of GPT-1 through 3 first, or uh, was there the intuition about the scaling law first? The intuition, so I would say that the way, the way I'd phrase it is that I had a very strong belief that bigger is better. And that one of the goals that we had at OpenAI is to figure out how to use the scale correctly. There was a lot of belief about in OpenAI about scale from the very beginning. The question is, what to use it for precisely? Because I'll mention, right now we're talking about the GPTs, but there's another very important line of work which I haven't mentioned, the second big idea. But I think now is a good time to make a detour, and that's reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. That clearly seems important as well. What do you do with it? So the first really big project that was done inside OpenAI was our effort at solving a real-time strategy game. And for context, a real-time strategy game is like, it's a competitive sport. Yeah, right. We need to be smart, mm -hmm. you need to have fast, you need to have a quick reaction time, you, there's teamwork, and you're competing against another team. And it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty involved. And there is a whole competitive league for that game. The game is called Dota 2. And so we train a reinforcement learning agent to play against itself, to produce with the goal of reaching a level so that it could compete against the best mm -hmm. players in the world. Mm -hmm. And that was a major undertaking as well. Mm -hmm. It was a very different line. It was mm -hmm. reinforcement learning. Yeah, I remember the day that, that uh, you guys announced that work. And this is this. By the way, when I was asking earlier about 
about there's a, there's a large body of work that have come out of OpenAI. Some of it seem like detours, um, but but in fact, as you're, as you're explaining now, they might might have been detours. It's seemingly detours, but they they really led up to some of the important work that we're now talking about, ChatGPT. Yeah, I mean, there has been real convergence mm -hmm. where the GPTs produce the foundation, and then the reinforcement learning from Dota morphed into reinforcement learning from human feedback. That's right. And that combination mm -hmm. gave us ChatGPT. You know, there's a there's a there's a, a misunderstanding that that uh, ChatGPT is uh, in itself just one giant large language model. There's a system around it that's fairly complicated. It is it, could could you could you explain um, briefly for the audience the the uh, the fine tuning of it, the reinforcement learning of it, the the um, uh, you know the various uh, surrounding systems that allows you to uh, keep it on rails and, and uh, let it, let it uh, uh, give it knowledge and, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah, I can. So the way to think about it is that when we train a large neural network to accurately predict the next word mm -hmm. in lots of different texts from the internet, what we are doing is that we are learning a world model. It looks like we are learning this. It may, it may look on the surface that we are just learning statistical correlations in text. But it turns out that to just learn the statistical correlations in text, to compress them really well, what the neural network learns is some representation of the process that produced the text. This text is actually a projection of the world. There is a world out there and it has a projection on this text. And so what the neural network is learning is more and more aspects of the world, of people, of the human conditions, their, their, their hopes, dreams, and motivations, their interactions and the situations that we are in. And the neural network learns a compressed, abstract, usable representation of that. Mm -hmm. This is what's being learned from accurately predicting the next word. And furthermore, the more accurate you are at predicting the next word, the higher the fidelity, the more resolution you get in this process. So that's what the pre-training mm -hmm. stage does. Mm -hmm. But what this does not do is specify the desired behavior that we wish our neural network to exhibit. You see, a language model, what it really tries to do is to answer the following question. If I had some random piece of text on the internet which starts with some prefix, some prompt, what will it complete to? Mm -hmm. If you just randomly ended up on some text from the internet. But this is different from, well, I want to have an assistant which will be truthful, that will be helpful, that will follow certain guide rules and not violate them. That requires additional training. This is where the fine-tuning and the reinforcement learning from human teachers and other forms of AI assistance. It's not just reinforcement learning from human teachers. It's also reinforcement learning from human and AI collaboration. Our teachers are working together with an AI to teach our AI to behave. But here we are not teaching it new knowledge. This is not what's happening. We are teaching it. We are communicating with it. We are communicating to it what it is that we want it to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this process, the second stage, is also extremely important. The better we do the second stage, the more useful, the more reliable this neural network will be. So the second stage is extremely important too, in addition to the first stage of the learn everything, from, learn everything, learn as much as you can about the world from the projection mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm. Which is text. Now you could tell you could you could uh, fine tune it. You could uh, instruct it to uh, perform certain things. Can you instruct it to not perform certain things so that you could give it guardrails about avoid these type of behavior? Um, you know, give it some kind of a bounding box so that so that it doesn't it doesn't wander out of that bounding box and and perform things that that are you know yes. unsafe or otherwise. Yeah. So this second stage of training is indeed where we communicate to the neural network anything we want, which includes the bounding box. Mm -hmm. 
And the better we do this training, the higher the fidelity with which we communicate this bounding box. And so with constant research and innovation on improving this fidelity, we are able, we improve this fidelity, and so it becomes more and more reliable mm -hmm. and precise mm -hmm. in the way in which it follows the intended, intended instructions. ChatGBT came out just a few months ago. Um, fastest growing application in the history of humanity. Uh, uh, lots of, lots of uh, 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 interpretations about why. Um, but some of the some of the things that that uh, is clear, it is it is the easiest application that anyone has ever created for anyone to use. Uh, it performs tasks, it performs things, it does things that are beyond people's expectation. Uh, anyone can use it. There are no instruction sets. There are no wrong ways to use it. You you just use it, and uh, if it's if your instructions are are prompts are ambiguous, the conversation refines the ambiguity until your intents are uh, understood by, by, the, uh, by the application, by the AI. Uh, the the um, impact, of course, uh, clearly remarkable. Now, yesterday, this is the day after GPT-4, just a few uh, months later, uh, the, the performance of GPT-4 uh, in many areas, astounding. Um, SAT scores, GRE scores, bar exams, um, the, the number of, the number of uh, um, tests that it's able to perform at, at very capable levels, very capable human levels, uh, astounding. Uh, what, were the, what were the major differences between ChatGPT and GPT-4 that led to its improvements in these, in these areas? So GPT-4 is a pretty substantial improvement on top of chat GPT across very many dimensions. We train GPT-4, I would say, between more than six months ago, maybe eight months ago, I don't remember exactly. GPT, the first big difference between chat GPT and GPT-4, and that perhaps is the more the most important difference is that the base on top of GPT-4 is built predicts the next word with greater accuracy. This is really important because the better a neural network can predict the next word in text, the more it understands it. This claim is now perhaps accepted by many at this point, but it might still not be intuitive or not completely intuitive as to why that is. So I'd like to take a small detour and to give an analogy that will hopefully clarify why more accurate prediction of the next word leads to more understanding, real understanding. Let's consider an example. Say you read a detective novel. It's like a complicated plot, a storyline, different characters, lots of events, mysteries like clues, it's unclear. Then, let's say that at the last page of the book, the detective has gathered all the clues, gathered all the people, and mm -hmm. saying, okay, I'm going to reveal the identity of whoever committed the crime. Mm -hmm. And that person's name is... Predict that word. Predict that word. Yeah. Exactly. My goodness. Right? Yeah, right. Now, there are many different words, mm -hmm. but by predicting those words better and better and better, mm -hmm. the understanding of the text keeps on increasing. Mm -hmm. GPT-4 predicts the next word better. You know, Ilya, people say that, that deep learning... Right won't lead to reasoning, that deep learning won't lead to reasoning. But in order to predict that next word, figure out from all of the agents that were there and, and all of their you know, strengths or weaknesses or their intentions and uh, the context um, and to be able to predict that word, who, who was the murderer, that requires some amount of reasoning, a fair amount of reasoning. And so, so how did the... How did the how is it that 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 it's able to pre, to learn reasoning and and if if it learned reasoning, um, it, you know one of the one of the things that I was going to ask you is of all the tests that were that were taken um, between ChatGPT and GPT four, there were some tests 
that GPT-3 or ChatGPT was already very good at. There were some tests that GPT-3 or ChatGPT was not as good at um, that GPT-4 was much better at. And there were some tests that neither are good at yet. I would love for it, you know, and some of it has to do with reasoning, it seems. That, you know, maybe in, in calculus that, that it wasn't able to break maybe the problem down um, into, into its reasonable steps and solve it. it, is, it, is, it but yet, in some areas, it, it seems to demonstrate reasoning skills. And so, is that an area that that um, uh, that in predicting the next word, you're you're learning reasoning, and um, uh, what are the limitations uh, now of GPT four that would enhance its ability to reason even even further? You know, reasoning isn't this super well defined concept, mm -hmm. but we can try to define it anyway, which is when you maybe. Maybe when you go further, where you're able to somehow think about it a little bit and get a better answer because of your reasoning. And I'd say, I'd say that our neural nets, you know, maybe there is some kind of limitation which could be addressed by, for example, asking the neural network to think out loud. This mm -hmm. has proven to be extremely effective for reasoning. But I think it also remains to be seen just how far the basic neural network will go. I think we have yet to uh, tap fully tap out its potential. But yeah, I mean, there is definitely some sense where reasoning is still not quite at that level as some of the other capabilities of the neural network. Though we would like the reasoning capabilities of the neural network to be high. Mm -hmm. higher, I think that it's fairly likely that business as usual will keep, will improve the reasoning capabilities of the neural network. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily confidently rule out this possibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because one of the things that, that, that is really cool is you ask, you ask uh, ChatGPT a question, um, but before it answers the question, tell me first, first of what you know, and then to answer the question. Um, you know, usually when somebody answers a question, if you give me the the foundational knowledge that you have or the foundational assumptions that you're making before you answer the question, uh, that really improves the my believability of of the answer. Um, you're also demonstrating some level of reason. Well, you're demonstrating reasoning, and so it seems to me that ChatGPT has this inherent capability embedded in it. Yeah, to some degree. Yeah. This the 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 this, the the way the one way to think about what's happening now is that these neural networks have a lot of these capabilities. They're just not quite very reliable. Mm -hmm. In fact, you could say that reliability is currently the single biggest obstacle for these neural networks being useful, truly useful. If sometimes it is still the case that these neural networks hallucinate a little bit or maybe make some mistakes which are unexpected, which you wouldn't expect a person to make. It is this kind of unreliability that makes them substantially less useful. But I think that perhaps with a little bit more research, with the current ideas that we have, and perhaps a few more of the ambitious research plans, we'll be able to achieve higher reliability as well. Mm -hmm. And that will be truly useful. That will allow us to have very accurate guardrails, which are That's very right. precise. That's right. And it will make it ask for clarification where mm -hmm. it's unsure. Mm -hmm. Or maybe say that it doesn't know something when it does when it indeed doesn't know. Mm -hmm. And do so extremely reliably. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that these are some of the bottlenecks really. Mm -hmm. So it's not about whether it exhibits some particular mm -hmm. capability, mm -hmm. but more how reliable to the degree exactly. Of it. Yeah. yeah. You know, one is speaking of speaking of, of factualness and factfulness, uh Hallucination. Uh, I, I I saw in in uh, one of the videos uh, a demonstration that that um, uh, links to a Wikipedia page. Uh, to it, does retrieval capability uh, has that been been included in the GPT four? Is it able to uh, retrieve information from a factful place that that uh, could augment its response to you? So the current GPT four, as released does not have a built-in retrieval capability. Mm -hmm. It is just a really, really 
code next word predictor, mm -hmm. which can also consume images, by the way. We haven't spoken about yeah, it, I'm but it is, ask you about it is really good yeah, at images, right. mm -hmm. which is also then fine-tuned with data and various reinforcement learning variants to behave in a particular way. Mm -hmm. It is perhaps, I'm, I'm sure someone will, will uh, it wouldn't surprise me if some of the people who have access could perhaps request GPT-4 to maybe make some queries and then populate the results inside, inside the context. Yeah, right. Because also the context duration of GPT-4 is quite a bit longer now. Yeah, that's right. So, in short, although GPT-4 does not support built-in retrieval, mm -hmm. it is completely correct that it will get better with yeah. retrieval. Yeah. Yeah. Multimodality. GPT-4 has the ability to learn from text and images and uh, respond to input from text and images. Uh, for, first of all, the foundation of multimodality learning, um, of course, Transformers uh, has made it possible for us to learn from multimodality, you tokenize text and images. Uh, but at the foundational level, help us understand how multimodality enhances the understanding of the world um, beyond text by itself. And, uh, and my understanding is that, that, that when you, when you um, uh, do multimodality learning, that even when it is just a text prompt, the text prompt, the text understanding could actually be enhanced. Um, t tell us about multimodality at the foundation, why it's so important, and, and um, what was the, what's the major breakthrough and the, the, and, and the characteristic differences as a result. So there are two dimensions to multimodality. Two reasons why it is interesting. The first reason is a little bit humble. The first reason is that multimodality is useful. It is useful for a neural network to see vision in particular, because the world is very visual. Human beings are very visual animals. I believe that a third of the visual core of the human cortex is dedicated to vision. And so, by not having vision, the usefulness of our neural networks, though still considerable, is not as big as it could be. Mm -hmm. So it is a very simple usefulness argument. Mm -hmm. It is simply useful to see. And GPT-4 can see quite well. The, there is a second reason to do vision, which is that we learn more about the world by learning from images in addition to learning from text. That is also a powerful argument, though it is not as clear-cut as it may seem. And I'll give you an example. Or rather, before giving an example, I'll make the general comment. For a human being, us human beings, we get to hear about one billion words in our entire life. Only? Only one billion words. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. That's not a lot. Yeah, that's not a lot. So, we need to compensate. We need. Does that include my own words in my own head? <laughs> you know, to make it two billion words if you want. But you see what I mean. Yeah. You know, we can, we can see that because um, a billion seconds is 30 years. So you can kind of see, like, yeah. we don't get to see more than a few words a That's second, right. and then we are asleep half the time. Yeah. So, like, a couple billion words is the total we get in our entire life. Mm -hmm. So it becomes really important for us to get as many sources of information as we can. Mm -hmm. And we absolutely learn a lot more from vision. The same argument holds true for our neural networks as well, except, except for the fact that the neural network can learn from so many words. So, things which are hard to learn about the world from text in a few billion words may become easier from trillions of words. And I'll give you an example. Consider colors. Surely, one needs to see to understand colors. And yet, the text-only neural networks who never seen a single photon in their entire life, if you ask them which colors are more similar to each other, 
it will know that red is more similar to orange than to blue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It will know that blue is more similar to purple mm -hmm. than to yellow. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? And one answer is that information about the world, even the visual information, slowly leaks in through text, but slowly, not as quickly. But when you have a lot of text, you can still learn a lot. Of course, once you also add vision and learning about the world from vision, you will learn additional things which are not captured in text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it is not, I would not say that it is a binary. There are things which are impossible to learn from, te from mm -hmm. text only. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this is more of an exchange rate. Yeah. And in particular, as you want to learn, if, if, we are, if, you, if, you are, if you are like a human being and you want to learn from a billion words or a hundred million words, then of course the other sources of information become far more important. Yeah, and so so the the uh, you learn from images. Is there is there a sensibility that that would suggest that if we wanted to understand um, also the construction of the world, as in you know the arm is connected to my shoulder, that my elbow is connected, that somehow the, these things move the 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 the. the, anim, the the animation of the world, the, yeah. the physics of the world. If I wanted to learn that as well, can I just watch videos and learn that? Yes. Yeah. And, and if I wanted to augment all of that with sound, like for example, if somebody said um, the meaning of, of great, uh, great could be great, or great could be great, you know? <laughs> so so <laughs> one is sarcastic, one is enthusiastic. Uh, th there are many, many words like that, you know? Uh, uh, that's sick, or you know, I'm sick, or I'm sick. Depending on how people say it, uh, are, are, would would audio also make a contribution to the learning of the the uh, the model? And and could we put that to good use soon? Yes. Yeah. I think I think it's definitely the case that, well, you know, what can we say about audio? It's useful. It's an mm -hmm. additional source of information. Probably not as much as images yeah. or video, but. There is, an, there, there is a case to be made for the usefulness of audio as well, both on the recognition side mm -hmm. and on the production side. Mm -hmm. When you, when you um, I, on, the, on the context of the scores that I saw, um, the, the thing that was really interesting was, was uh, the, the data that you guys published, which, which one of the tests were, were um, uh, performed well by GPT-3 and which one of the tests performed substantially better with GPT-4. Um, how did multimodality contribute to those tests, do you think? Oh, I mean, in a pretty straightforward, straightforward way, anytime there was a test where a problem would, where to understand the problem, you need to look at a diagram. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, in some math competitions, yeah. like there is a cont math competition for high school students called AMC, AMC 12, 10, 12 okay, right? Yeah. And there, presumably, many of the problems have a, Diagram. Mm -hmm. So, GPT three point five does quite badly on that, on that, ex on that, ex on that test. GPT four with text only does, I think I don't remember, but it's like maybe from two percent to twenty percent accuracy of success rate. But then when you add vision, it jumps to forty percent success uh -huh. rate. Uh, yeah. So the vision is really okay. doing a lot of work. Mm -hmm. The vision is extremely good, and. I think being able to reason visually as well and communicate visually will also be very powerful and very nice things, which go beyond just learning about the world. Mm -hmm. There are several things. You, got to learn, you can learn about the world. You can then reason about the world visually. And you can communicate visually. Where now, in the future, perhaps, in some future version, if you ask your neural net, hey, like, explain this to me, rather than just producing four paragraphs, it will produce, yeah, hey, like, here's right. like a little diagram which clearly conveys to you exactly what you need to know and so yeah, on. that's incredible. You know, one of the things that you said earlier about, about an AI generating, generating a, a test to train another AI, um, you know, there's, there was a paper that was written about, and I, 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 don't, I don't completely know whether, whether it's factual or not, but, but um, that there's, there's a total amount of somewhere between 4 trillion to something like 20 trillion useful, you know, tokens in, in language tokens that, that the world will be able to train on, you know, over some period of time and that we're going to run out of tokens to train. And, and, um, 
I, I, well, first of all, I wonder if that's the, the, you feel the same way. And then the secondary, secondarily, uh, whether whether the AI generating its own um, data uh, could be used to train the AI itself, which you could argue is a little circular, but um, we train our brain with generated data all the time by uh, self-reflection, um, working through a problem in our brain, uh, you know, and, and uh, or, you know, some, I guess, I guess neuroscientists suggest sleeping. Uh, we, we do a lot of fair amount of, tr- you know, developing our neurons. Um, how do you see this, this area of synthetic data generation? Is that going to be an important part of the future of training AI and, and the AI teaching itself? Well, that's, I think, like, I, I wouldn't underestimate the data that exists out there. Mm-hmm. I think there's probably, I think there's probably more, more data than people realize. And as to your second question, certainly a possibility mm-hmm. remains to be seen. Yeah. Yeah, it see, it it really does seem that that um, uh, one of these days our AIs are are um, you know when we're not using it, maybe generating either adversarial content for itself to learn from, or in, imagine solving problems that that it can go off and and then and then uh, improve itself. Uh, tell tell us uh, uh, whatever you can about about uh, uh, where we are now and and what do you think will be in in not not too distant future, but you know, pick pick your your horizon a year or two. Uh, what do you think this whole language model area would be, and some of the areas that you're most excited about? You know, predictions are hard, and um, it's a bit. It's a bit. Although it's a little difficult to say things which are too specific, I think it's safe to assume that progress will continue, and that we will keep on seeing systems which astound us. In their, in the things that they can do, and the current frontiers are will be centered around reliability, mm-hmm. around the system can be trusted. Really get into a point where we can trust what it produces. Really get into a point where if it doesn't understand something, it asks for a clarification. Says that it doesn't know something. Says that it needs more information. I think those are perhaps the biggest, the areas where improvement will lead to the biggest impact on the usefulness of those mm-hmm. systems. Mm-hmm. Because right now, that's mm-hmm. really what stands in the way. You have, an, you have asking neural net for, you ask a neural net to maybe summarize some long document and you get a summary. Like, are you sure that some important detail wasn't omitted? It's still a useful summary, but it's a different story when you know mm-hmm. that all the important points have been covered. At some point, like, and in particular, it's okay, like, if some, even there is ambiguity, it's fine. But if a point is clearly important, such that anyone else who saw that point would say, this is really important, when the neural network will also recognize that reliably, mm-hmm. that's when you know. Same for the guardrail, same, same for its ability to clearly follow the intent of the user, of, of its operator. So I think we'll see a, a lot of that in the next two years. Yeah, that's terrific because th- those, the progress in those two areas will make this technology uh, trusted by people to use and be able to apply it for so many things. I, I was thinking that was going to be the last question, but I did have another one. Sorry about okay, that. Okay, go for it. So, so chat, uh, chat GPT to GPT four, um, GPT four when when it first when you first started using it, uh, what are some of the skills that it demonstrated that surprised even you? Well, there were lots of really cool things that it demonstrated, which, which, has, which were quite cool and surprising. It was, it was quite good. So I'll mention two examples. So let's see. I'm just, I'm just trying to think about the best way to go about it. The short answer is that the level of its reliability was surprising, mm-hmm. where... The previous neural networks, if you ask them a question, sometimes they might misunderstand something in a kind of a silly way. Whereas with GPT-4, that stopped happening. Its ability to solve math problems became far greater. Mm-hmm. It's like you could really, like, say, <laughs> you know, like, really do the derivation and like long, complicated derivation yeah. and you could convert the units and so mm-hmm. on. And that was really cool. You know, like many people. It works have, through a proof. It works through a proof. 
Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Not all proofs, yeah, naturally, but, yeah. but, but quite a few. Yeah. Or another example would be, like many people noticed that it has the ability to produce poems with, you know, every word starting with the same letter right. or yeah. every word starting with some... It follows right? instructions really, really clearly. Not perfectly still, yeah. but much better That's than right. before. Yeah, really good. And on the vision side, mm -hmm. I really love how it can explain jokes, mm -hmm. it can explain memes. Mm -hmm. You show it a meme and ask it why it's funny and it mm -hmm. will tell you and it will be correct. The, vi the vision part, I think, is very was also very, it's like really actually seeing it when you can ask follow-up questions about some complicated image with a complicated diagram and get an explanation, that's really cool. But yeah, overall, I will say, to take a step back, you know, I've been, <clears throat> I've been in this business for quite some time, actually, like almost exactly 20 years. And the thing which, most, which I find most surprising is that it, actually works <laughs> yeah like it it turned out to be the same little thing all along which is no longer little and is a lot more serious and much more intense but it's the same neural network just larger trained on maybe larger data sets in different ways mm -hmm. with the same fundamental training algorithm yeah so it's like wow i would say this is what i find the most surprising yeah Whenever I take a step back, I go, how is it possible that those ideas, those conceptual ideas about, well, the brain has neurons, so maybe artificial neurons are just as good, mm -hmm. and so maybe we just need to train them somehow with some learning algorithm, that those arguments turned out to be so incredibly correct. That would be the biggest surprise, I'd say. In the, in the 10 years that, that we've known each other, uh, you're... you're uh, the, near, the, the models that you've trained and the amount of data you've trained from uh, the, what you did on AlexNet to now is about a million times. And, and uh, uh, no, no one in the world of computer science would have, would have believed that the amount of computation that was done in that 10 years' time would be a million times larger and that, that uh, you dedicated your career to go, go do that. Um, you've done two, uh, many more, uh, your body of work is incredible, but two seminal works and in the invention, the co-invention with AlexNet and that, that early work and, and now with, uh, GPT at OpenAI, uh, it, it is, it is truly remarkable what you've accomplished. It's, it's great to catch up with you again, Ilya, my good friend. And, and, um, uh, it is, uh, it is quite an amazing moment. And so uh, today's, today's talk, the way you, you uh, break down the problem and describe it. Uh, this is one of the one of the uh, the the best PhD uh, beyond PhD descriptions of the state of the art of la large language models. I really appreciate that. It's great to see you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank I you. Had so, I had so much fun. Thank you. <laughs>